Is this close enough, or is that, do I need to move That's it up? Good. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Kathy Ellick. So Kathy Ellick is the Associate Lab Director from Lawrence Berkeley, the Division on Computational uh, Research. And actually, Kathy is the Director of NERSC, Acting Director of NERSC, <laughs> and also a professor here in UC Berkeley. And Kathy has done substantial uh, work in programming models and languages. As a matter of fact, is the lead uh, developer or designer of uh, UPC. Definitely not developer, not lead developer. No. Okay. <laughs> designer of, of UPC. Uh -huh. And so that's, as I mentioned yesterday, you know, given the relevance of programming in this uh, very difficult uh, systems nowadays and, you know, what is ahead, that's what we thought of uh, talking to Kathy about algorithms and programming models. So welcome, Kathy. Thanks very much. So yeah, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, a little bit, a little bit about programming models and a little bit about um, about algorithms. And um, I'm going to start by talking about some of the uh, just sort of the history of performance growth and where we're at in performance growth. I don't know if you've had nobody else has talked to Exascale yet. Is that right? Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't doing too much redundant, uh, too many redundant slides with somebody else. I had looked at the schedule; it didn't look like you had. So, um, um, this is actually um, a, a history of computing performance based on what are called the Gordon Bell Prizes. Anybody here uh, applied for a Gordon Bell Prize? Other than, yeah, okay, the instructor, okay, good. So Gordon Bell Prizes come out every year at the Supercomputing Conference, and they're, um, they're measuring a, a large application running on a very large machine. And um, by the way, if we, if we plotted this against something like um, the uh, top 500 list, which measures the, the, the LINPAC, the, the, um, basically the, uh, the speed at which uh, the uh, machines do matrix multiplies, which is actually measured as LU de decomposition, um, you get a very similar curve. So basically, these applications have tracked that. Now, in each one of these poor machines over time, um, there's a lot of work that goes into analyzing those those codes. So um, don't don't expect that necessarily everybody is getting this kind of performance by by any means across the machines. These are people uh, uh, that win prizes for the performance on each of these. Now, um, if you look at what happened historically, there was a big revolution in the early 90s, which was uh, at the time called attack of the killer micros. Uh, at least that was one of the phrases. Um, these older machines, these Cray machines, were vector supercomputers. So single computer systems, custom designed for doing scientific computations, uh, large scale vector units on them, meaning that they could do operations, very wide operations on a large set of data. So you'd say, you know, 64, uh, a load an array of 64 elements at the hardware level and have it do a multiply on every one of the, every, you know, every pair of elements in, in two of those registers. So um, that's what those architectures looked like. They weren't really used for other kinds of um, computational problems other than scientific computing. And um, so what happened then was microprocessors became so much faster because they were writing the Moore's was this huge market force behind them um, in terms of making those microprocessors faster, the kind of things that are in servers and, and um, desktop machines and things like that, that we started building these clusters um, out of uh, microprocessors. So I'll come back and say a little bit more about where we're at today. But um, if you also, if you look at the top 500 list, which lists the top, the, the fastest top uh, 500 machines in the world, uh, at least people who are willing to have their machine listed on that list and um, run this LINPAC benchmark, uh, this gives you some idea of what the architectures look like over time. So you can sort of see that back here when it says single processor, these are single vector processors. So they have these vector instructions. And there's these um, SMP machines, which were also, some of those were also vector processors, but they were also just shared memory machines um, that had, so all of the processors could talk to each other by um, reading and writing variables in shared memory. Um, and then we started getting these clusters that are MPP. So di distinction between an MPP and a cluster, you can think of as basically how, who, who built their network. Um, is it a commodity network uh, which you can, and you configure the cluster yourself, or do you go and buy a massively parallel multiprocessor from a company like Intel or IBM uh, or Cray? Um, Actually, I think back at this time, Intel was actually selling those things too. So um, now, an interesting thing about that that history is um, because of these 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 clusters became very popular. That the industrial use of machines on this this list, that is, companies that actually had one of the machines on the top 500 list, doubled over this time period from about 25 percent here to about 50 percent of the list being industrial uh, machines on the list. Um, how were they programmed? Well. 
Um, these vector machines and the shared memory machines were programmed to some extent by just annotating serial programs. So you took your Fortran code, you would annotate a loop and said this is a vectorizable loop. Um, there, there were other things, and the compiler would sometimes give you feedback about things you wanted to do. Um, whereas when we started writing the code for clusters, this was a huge revolution in the scientific software because you had to completely rewrite um, the, the codes for this message passing parallelism, which is what you've been learning about today, uh, or learning about in this, in this class, um, uh, and, and some of the libraries that are built on that, that idea. And um, in addition to that, people had to, in many cases, rethink the algorithms as well, not just the software. Um, so that's a, that was a revolution that, what, that the industry, uh, that the community went through. Um, and what I think the, the main point I want to make here in this background section is about the next revolution that we're about to go through. So this is a graph of Moore's law. Um, if you read the, uh, if you only read things like the New York Times, you might get a little confused and think that, think that Moore's law has ended. Uh, Moore's law has not ended. This is uh, transistor density growth um, over time. And more, what Moore's law is actually about is how many tra transistors can you put um, in, a, in a fixed area on a chip. So it's about transistor density. And at least for now, that is still growing. There is, there are going to be problems with that in the in the near future. Um, but it, right now, we're still putting a lot more transistors on a chip. Um, the problem has been, this started in about 2004, is that we couldn't use that to make the processors go faster. So frequency, which is the clock rate of the, the processors, um, almost leveled out in 2004. And in fact, in some cases, in some lines, you'll see that the processor speed came down. So for a particular vendor, uh, the processors actually started getting slower. Um, and they did that because they were, in some sense, over-engineered to try to make those as fast as possible when they were riding this curve right here. The, the um, processor designers were trying to make their processors go faster and faster, kind of almost keeping up with Moore's law. You can see not quite, but almost keeping up with Moore's law in terms of the uh, perform exponential performance growth. But, um, but they, the, the processor became too hot. Um, and so you can sort of see that in the, the number of watts that they were using. Um, and if you projected this out, you're going to have serious problems with the heat density on the chips. And so the, uh, the heat density leveled off the, with the power, um, and so did the, uh, um, and so did the uh, frequency. But you still have all these transistors. So what everybody started doing, of course, is putting multiple cores onto the chip, multiple processors, that marketing people got involved and decided not to call them processors anymore because then they couldn't call the whole chip a processor, so they called them multi-core chip processors um, and then kind of confused us all. But anyway, um, so of course that's what we've got today are these multi-core chips. Um, and uh, but even worse than that, power density problem is still a problem today. And really, performance growth, and continuing that, is going to be about how to design uh, low power processors. So this is you know, looking now that, at that historical growth of machines. The rest of the world started getting parallel computing in this 2004 time frame, because even if you go out and buy a laptop, of course, you get something with something like a quad core or dual core processor in it. Um, now, we'd like to continue performance for our nation's growth growing up to an exaflop. And if you just draw a line through these points, you get an exaflop coming in maybe a little bit after 2020. If you look at it actually where it crosses over, 2022, something like that. But um, pretty close to 2020, actually. Um, so what is the problem with, with trying to keep these, the application performance growing? It is about the power that's used in the machine. Now, as somebody who's also a facility director, I worry about this a lot. Um, there's a few million dollars a year that we spend on the electricity bill. Um, but even more importantly than that, um, in terms of the cost, is every time we buy a new computer, we have to go out and buy more cooling equipment, more power equipment, um, and make sure that the power company is willing to feed uh, more megawatts into our facility to um, upgrade the facility along with the computer system. So we're spending more money both on the infrastructure in the center and also on the, um, and also on the, on the electricity bill. And this is also true for companies like Google that run cloud services, Amazon, Yahoo, and so on. It's not just um, supercomputers that have this problem. Everybody's running into this problem that you're putting a lot of money into the um, infrastructure and into the electricity. Um, so the, this is a, a, a graph that was put together um, by a study. I was actually involved in this study many, a number of years ago looking at w whether we could build an exaflop machine, and if, if so, um, what, uh, how much power would it use? And what they said is, well, if you look at just Moore's law scaling, and Moore's law, because you're making the wires shorter when you make the, de the transistors denser, um, does you, gives you some significant improvements in, um, ener in power efficiency of the processor. Um, but if you were going to just follow that trend and try to build an exaflop system out in 2020, it would 
consume about 100 to, 100 to 200 megawatts of power. If you're not used to thinking of megawatts, just to give you a sense, a megawatt costs about a million dollars a year, a little cheaper here at, at Berkeley Lab because we get a special deal on our, our electricity rates, but just order of magnitude, that's what it costs um, people to do that. So, um, you know, and, and how much are we using today? Well, the petaflop hopper system, which is not where you're doing your homework, your, your um, hands-on assignments, I think, uh, you're using one of the smaller systems right now, partly because we, we took hopper down for maintenance today, um, but uh, that petaflop system hopper uses about three megawatts of power. Power. So if you if you did a really naive scaling and said without even looking at transistor density and tried to build an exaflop machine, that'd be a three gigawatt system, um, which is if you tried to build it in, in the technology in 2010 that was used in Hopper. Um, so that would be a three gigawatt system. It would cost $3 billion a year in electricity. Um, you know, this Moore's Law scaling brings it down to about 100 and, uh, 120 million or something, $130 million a year in electricity, but it still uh, certainly exceeds our budget. Our budget is about 50 uh, 55, 60 million dollars a year. So, um, and this problem about power is not just about, you know, just building one exaflop machine. It's the problem of even trying to build cloud centers or lots of data centers. If we were trying to build a thousand one petaflop machines, we'd have the same power problem. So these problems are not just about um, kind of the, the biggest calculation running on the biggest machine. So to people who know how to design low power processors, you don't talk to the server vendors, you, uh, designers, you talk to the uh, cell phone processor designers, because cell phone designers understand how to get low power processors. Most pro processor designers that have been worrying about, and this, uh, this is a, an image of an Intel Nehalem pro uh, quad core processor chip, um, the, the designers on that, I mean, it's not like they don't know what they're doing, but um, they've been used to the idea that we're plugging this into the wall, we're not so worried about power, um, it's not very expensive if you only got a small number of servers in your um, machine room. So that server processor consumes about 100 watts and runs it at 50 gigaflops. Cell phone processor by comparison, and this is actually a Tensilica uh, processor, which is, um, is used in um, cell phones, is, is substantially slower, so uh, an order of magnitude slower, 4 gigaflops instead of 50 gigaflops, but it consumes only 0.1 watts. So a thousand times less power. Um, and so overall, you get about a factor of 100 improvement in energy efficiency. Uh, you know, I, I don't know offhand, but I'm sure it's, not, uh, it's not, not, not real high, although I think some of the technology that people are looking at for memory is, you know, for the cell phone processors for that very reason. So, yeah, low power um, memory and so, so on. But, um, yeah, so, and, and we'll get to that, that issue that a lot of the power in these systems is actually going into the, into the memory system. So, um, all right, so we have to think about um, using low, low power processors and um, you know, the blue gene line of processors uh, that are in those blue gene systems were influenced by this. They took low power processors that were in, used in embedded environments and used them to build supercomputers. Um, and now, you know, can we take that a step further using things like the, the little tiny processors that are inside of graphics processing units um, and things like that? Those are the, the kinds of things we'll be looking at to get to exascale. Um, so, you know, this is uh, now our history. What happens, it, we, we can call this, this next transition attack of the killer cell phones. Um, so we're going to have to figure out how to design these systems that have uh, lower power or better energy power efficiency um, and figure out how to program them. And though the problem then, it, it, just to emphasize, is not how do I build a big, huge system. The real challenge is um, how, what are the building blocks that I'll use that will allow me to do a large volume of computation, whether I want to do it at one site or many sites. Um, okay, so let's talk about how to measure efficiency. I was showing you, um, intentionally showing you application performance, although admittedly highly tuned application performance on that graph. Um, you know, and, and we can talk about peak performance, and the GPU people often like to talk about peak performance because they get very good power efficiency. Um, if you look at the number of floating point operations per watt that you get out of a GPU, it looks really great. Um, but how would we like to really measure um, how much you know, uh, science we can get done per watt? So, well, we don't have a very good metric for that. It's really hard to measure science. We all, anybody who's in a university environment has you know, gone through the tenure environment no, uh, process knows that uh, universities are not necessarily always very good at measuring scientific productivity either, um, but we could do it with publications, right? So bad universities, what they do is they just count your publications and decide whether you get tenure. So we can do the same thing at NERSS. So actually in 2010, which is the last time I calculated this, um, it, we, uh, NERSS granted 450 publications per megawatt year. Um, that was actually a pretty good, a very good number at the time. Um, that number is going to go down over time because we're putting in the hopper machine, which was not in in, uh, in 2010 or just had come in, uh, was uh, uh, that the, the was a uh, 
only, let's see, so the, the previous system didn't, didn't consume three megawatts, so each system we're putting in has a little bit more power, and the number of users tends to be more closely correlated to the number of publications than the, amount of, than the, the uh, power in the system, so that number will probably get worse over time. Um, if, you, if you look at, um, you know, where does the power go in the systems, and, and this is just important if you think, well, okay, these, these supercomputing centers are much too power hungry, let's just go and run in the cloud because the cloud is energy efficient and the cloud is, is almost free, right? Well, it's not quite true. Um, if you look at um, the cost inside of one of these centers, the cheapest systems that we run are the largest, newest systems on the floor per, if you look at the, the, the number of cents per core hour, a very cheap system. So, um, um, because you've got, uh, you don't scale the number of system administrators with the number of process, and, and because the, you've got the latest, more, more energy efficient technology in the newer processors. So uh, a smaller number of bigger systems is, uh, is better in terms of the energy efficiency and also in terms of the cost. So well, we can't really measure scientific productivity. The this way, we might want to look at something like application performance per watt. Um, and this is where, as I said, the newest, largest machines t tend to be the best. Um, and this is going to go up with Moore's law because you'll get more energy efficiency out of them. And so <clears throat> if we look at uh, techniques, and this is somewhat controversial, but if you look at techniques for minimizing energy use, we can look, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about ideas such as turning down the clock rate on processors in order to save energy. That's a good idea if you're not using that resource in the system, but typically because there's um, leakage current is a substantial piece of the, the, um, the uh, power that's, that, that it's related to a substantial fraction of the power, about half of the power in these systems, um, in general you want to turn the systems off rather than leaving them running and turning the clock speed down. So that tends to be a, a better idea for, sa for saving performance. Well, okay, so you're not center, uh, you're not managing computing centers and worrying about how to scale the clock speeds on the system, perhaps. Um, but what you are worried about is where the energy is going um, because you want to optimize to minimize energy um, in this exascale era because the systems are going to be designed to minimize energy and um, you, you need algorithms that are going to be well optimized for those energy efficient systems. If you look at today where energy goes, so this is picojoules to do a number of different operations. So this is a double precision floating point operation um, and this is today and what's projected for 2018. Um, and this is the amount of uh, the energy it is required to move data a certain distance across the machine. What you see is that as long as you're on chip in all these places, it's cheaper than um, or comparable to a floating point operation right here. But as soon as you go off chip, whether you're sending it all the way across the machine or you're just sending it to another chip on the same um, node, even in a, a shared memory architecture, um, you're consuming at least an order of magnitude to two orders of magnitude more, more energy. So we, all, we know already that communicating, um, sending messages and so on is expensive from a cost, uh, a time standpoint. It's also expensive from an energy stamp standpoint. Now, um, in addition to uh, the uh, um, cost of communicating, we also have to worry about the cost of synchronizing because um, these, every time you have a synchronization, so if you've written an MPI code and you have a barrier, a lot of times in your system there will be processors sitting idle at those barrier points and they're consuming um, energy while, they're, they're consuming power while, you're, um, while they're sitting there waiting at the barriers. Um, so processors don't run at exactly the same speed. So even if your program is doing exactly the same number of computations, the same number of flops um, on each one of the processors, they may not run at the same speed. They never actually did exactly because the cache behavior was going to be a little bit different. Um, but as hardware designers start managing the power and the temperature, that is the heat density within the processors, one of the things that is happening already is that processors will be down clocked by the low level system software or hardware because they're getting too hot. And now you're going to have processors that will really run at um, very different, um, di different uh, speeds. And so we, and, and, and we can't necessarily control this from the application software. In fact, I don't think we want to control this. I think the last thing we want to do as application developers is start uh, managing the, uh, the power in the systems. We certainly don't want to let the users at NERSC um, melt the system because they mismanage the, the power. Um, but we, and we, uh, so I think it will be controlled by the lower level system software um, and the hardware. But the application program needs to be aware of it. So the point is, if things are going to be va variable, you don't want to have a lot of synchronization points in your code. 
Okay, so there's other things that, and, and I won't say a lot about errors today. There's been a lot of discussion about increasing number of errors, hardware faults coming up or, or system faults coming up um, from these large systems, these large exascale systems. And I think the only thing I'll say about it here is that it is also a source of performance instability across the system. So um, fault resilience techniques will, in, in, if you try to hide failures at a lower level, it will turn into performance heterogeneity um, at the application level that you may see as an application programmer. Um, this is sort of an extreme case. This is actually hardware that was on the verge of, it, it had some problems in it. Um, you're seeing actually two different systems here run um, with uh, e what, what is across the x-axis is the processor number. Okay, so they're all running exactly the same computation and then they're hitting a barrier synchronization point and you're measuring the amount of time it takes for them to get through that phase of the computation. Now you would think because they're um, running the same computation they should all end about the same time. This kind of a performance variability you would expect because of things like caches and so on um, that, we, um, that we have been used to, but what you're seeing here is these huge spikes. And the problem is if you've got a barrier in your code, all the processors are going to be waiting for those spikes. What are the spikes from? They're actually from error co correcting code happening at the hardware level, so ECC in the memory system, where there's a, an error that can be corrected. So a single bit error can typically be corrected in these memory systems, um, but you have to kind of, it has to run a little bit of, uh, it, you know, it's to run some kind of hardware code in order to do the correction. Um, and that is a very fast process because it's all being done in hardware. But because the failure rates were high enough, you see these spikes. Now, what the system uh, managers realized when they saw this graph is those, those DRAM modules needed to be changed out in some of those processors because they were consistently getting this kind of number. So they were hitting enough ECC errors that you were seeing these spikes. So, you know, one conclusion is make sure you don't have bad uh, memory chips uh, or so bad but they're bad, bad enough that they're producing a, lot, a high rate of ECCs. Um, but the other conclusion is that even at the hardware level, when you put in very fast mechanisms for recovering from faults, you can disturb the performance of the higher level system software, so I mean, the higher level application software. So if we try to hide all of the faults in some kind of lower level software layer, most likely we're going to see it pop up again as performance instability. All right, so a couple things we should learn from this. One is that we want to avoid communication, um, and the second one is that we want to avoid synchronization. Um, I'm going to talk now a little bit about techniques for avoiding communication, and um, this is going to talk mainly about, about communication volume. So when we talk about communication, we can think about the volume of data being communicated and the frequency of messages, um, and I'll say a little bit more about the latter when I talk about programming models. Um, this is a uh, quote from the FY12 Congressional Budget Request. So this is the President's request for uh, this year's budget. Um, and one of the things, if you, you, know, you don't have to read all the details, but it says that um, the goal, one of the President's goals is to make the memory higher by reformulating the classified within the algorithm. So language in there that said communication avoidance is a good idea. Um, so we'll have to ask uh, Romney what he thinks about communication avoidance, but Obama seems to be in favor of it. Um, all right, to sort of summarize then the, the problems at Exascale that I, I talked about, currency, you know, we're going to have more and more processors of these little tiny lightweight GPUs or cell phone processors, lots of because of the energy, the cost of having more, um, more communication, more energy bandwidth. Uh, processor architecture. Don't know exactly what that's going to look like in the future, but um, it, you know it's it's likely that it'll be heterogeneous, meaning there'll be some fa some faster processors and some so slower processors. And um, what programming models should look like, I'll talk about a, a proposal for programming closer to the end. But we know that uh, the compilers get it all from you. That's pretty clear. I'll talk next about the problems that, that I haven't said a lot about resilience. A bisection bandwidth, which talks about how much bandwidth you have across the entire machine. This is the one problem that is very clearly an exascale system problem. That is, how much bandwidth you have across the machine is about how many cables you put across the whole machine. So that's something that um, you may not have a problem if you build a bunch of smaller machines. But uh, the other problems, and resilience is a little bit, uh, um, it, it really, what resilience depends on is how long, how many processor hours does your job run? Whether that job runs for uh, two weeks with a small number of processors or for two hours with a very large number of processors, the probability of hitting a failure goes up with the total number of processor hours that that job is consuming, and so resilience becomes a bigger issue with bigger jobs. 
Um, but most of these are really issues with just performance growth, not just with building a single exaflop machine. And so, you know, this is quite different than uh, what we had been worrying about in the last five years to get to, uh, ten years to get to, uh, from a, a terascale system to petascale system. Now it's really about uh, just what are the building blocks and how are we going to uh, how, how are we going to program these processors? Did you have a question? Yeah, and I get, you're right, and I, I had that on one of the earlier slides, but I didn't have in the summary. Good point, yes. And I think that, um, you know, communication and synchronization are both, are both big issues because of the performance uh, instability in these systems, I think. We're already seeing some of that. Well, actually, we're already seeing quite a bit of it, <laughs> and we're going to probably see more. So, um, okay, so now I'll talk a little bit just to give you an idea of what, it, you know, what does it mean to have algorithms that optimize for communication. And I'll tell you a little history of this project. Um, I have a, uh, a joint research group here here at Berkeley called the, the um, Bebop Group, which is the Berkeley uh, Performance and Optimization Group uh, run with Jim Demmel. And uh, for a number of years, we were working on the problem of how to make little tiny algorithmic kernels go really, really fast on whatever architectures we had around. And um, here's sort of a summary of some of that work. So Sam Williams, who's a graduate student in the group years ago, now is a research, uh, researcher um, at, up at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and a number of other people were involved in producing all this data, which is summarized here in this one graph. Um, so Sam, actually, in his PhD thesis, built something called the roofline model. And the roofline model is just a way of thinking about how fast can the performance on your system go, and then you can, you can show how, how much speed you're getting um, and, uh, and, and figure out from that whether or not you're doing pretty well. So this is a really important thing for you to, to, to know about um, either intuitively or by actually drawing these kind of graphs uh, because it tells you when to stop optimizing your code. And that's a really important thing um, as, an, uh, as a graduate student, certainly, or a postdoc to understand that you know, maybe you're just done and you're not going to get any more performance. So what, how does this roofline model work? I, my axes, I keep meaning to put these back in this version of the slide. Um, so this is this x-axis is the computational intensity. That says, how many floating op point operations am I doing for every um, load and store that I'm doing from the memory system, OK? So over on the right-hand side, here at 32, is DGEM. That's matrix multiply, dense matrix, matrix multiply, order n cubed algorithm with order or an order n squared data, very computationally intensive. It should run close to the peak uh, floating point performance of your machine, and in fact, that's what you'll see that it does. Um, and the, the y-axis then is the, the gigaflop rate, it's the performance, flops per second that you're getting out of your algorithms. So what is this diagonal line? That's probably the, the one that's the hardest to understand what it comes from. It's actually the bandwidth of the system. Um, and if you just think about, if you've got uh, flops per second here, and you've got um, flops per load and store here, um, the, the, the bandwidth, which is the bytes per second, becomes a diagonal line here. And so you can draw the stream, the bandwidth, which is measured by something like the stream benchmark, there's, by, by the way, a fair amount of complexity in figuring out exa exactly how to measure um, something like the, uh, the, the stream bandwidth on some of these architectures, but that's what that line is. And so at the other end of the spectrum, for something like sparse matrix vector multiply, which is SPMV, um, you're doing at least uh, one load for every floating point or every pair of floating point operations and multiplying an add. You're very likely doing even uh, more than that because you have to load an index as well as a uh, floating point value in order to, the, to the, do the multiply and add. Uh, hopefully, the, uh, the second value that you're multiplying by is already up in a, in a register. So your computational intensity here, first of all, it varies by the matrix type. There's three different matrices shown here here, um, and that's why it, you know, you've got um, different points because their computational intensity varies. But you can see that um, with this exception here, they're very uh, th these are right on the, the memory bandwidth. And this was actually insight that came from Rich Vudek a number of years ago. He's now in the faculty at Georgia Tech. And he said, because he, he was working on building uh, this system, OSCE, to optimize these sparse matrix kernels, and kind of came into the meeting one day and said, you know, if you just measure the amount of time it takes to read the matrix out of memory, that is almost equal to the running time of the SPMV algorithm. And that was very depressing to me because it said, you know, we can do all we want to optimize sparse matrix vector multiply, but you can't really avoid the matrix. So, you know, what are we going to do to make this go any faster? We're going to have to think of something, some other technique other than using sparse matrix vector multiply. Uh, the right-hand graph, of course, is showing this on a GPU. The point is just that you could also, um, you could also do, build these kinds of models on GPUs. And um, just to point out a couple of things besides this one um, sparse matrix kernel, which is off, and I think this is off the... Uh, the memory bandwidth one because it's got so many, um, it's got a large vector and is missing in the cache where you would kind of expect it to be. So it's pro we're probably under predicting the um, computational 
over predicting the computational intensity. GTC, which is the other thing that you see that's kind of substantially below the, the, uh, the roof line in both cases, um, is, uh, is a, a code, it's a gyrokinetics code that's doing, it's a particle and cell method, and basically what it's doing is um, remote updates into an array at a random location in the array. And um, those operations are very, um, they're, they're limited by synchronization operations, the ability to do an atomic operation, that is, read a value, uh, add to the value, and write the value back, as opposed to either reading or just doing flops. And so those tend to, to run um, at a slower rate than the, uh, the roofline model does, shows. Okay. All right. So depression about matrix vector multiply, what are we going to do about this? Um, well, um, fortunately, the gym, uh, uh, you know, my expertise is in computer science, so his expertise is in applied math. And so um, he said, well, maybe we should think about not using sparse matrix vector multiply as the kernel. Um, there are this set of block um, iterative solvers and things like that that don't use just a single matrix vector multiply. So that led to a set of, uh, of results and, and a, a series of papers and so on on looking at um, iterative methods, so Krilov subspace methods like like GM res and conjugate gradient and so on that, um, that are going to use a different kernel rather than sparse matrix vector multiply. So the question is, can we lower the communication cost? By, by communication cost here, I'm thinking of both the communication cost that is between the DRAM and the processor, so just reading the matrix out of memory. Also, in these algorithms, there tends to be communication cost in the, uh, there's dot products and things like that um, in between each SPMV or even within them um, that is across the machine. So you have both uh, kind of a bandwidth problem and a latency problem of communication in these. So they're, they're somewhat different. And I, I'm kind of glossing over the details here just to give you some intuition about um, how the, uh, the algorithm works. So uh, the time for the solvers was dominated by the sparse matrix vector multiply time, which is itself dominated by the time to read the matrix. And the other t thing that, that dominated the solver time was these global connect collectives, which are these reduction operations and so on. And that's really latency limited. OK, so what's the idea here is to, rather than doing a single um, matrix vector multiply at every iteration, we'll try to take multiple steps in a solver by reading the matrix just once. And what I'll show you here in the picture, in the example, is what happens for a tridiagonal matrix. So a tridiagonal matrix is like a one-dimensional grid. right? So you just have nearest neighbor computation to the left and the right. So those, that's what gives you the, tri, the three diagonals in the tridiagonal matrix. And so think of this as the grid. Um, um, not the matrix, but the grid that is uh, generating the matrix, and we're going to look at uh, what are the values that you need to read at each point. So each at each step, if you go, you start with x, and you get a times x. You need um, the three values, the neighboring values, in order to get um, a times x. And then, so we can kind of draw this as a little triangle, and it grows up over time to look like this. So in order to get this point, uh, we need to have all these values, neighboring values, um, in order to compute that, um, and all the the edge values which are in the matrix. Um, so you, you can now kind of see how you, you can build up, hopefully, a, uh, a set of these things, but the, 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 they build these trapezoids because you don't have enough information if you, if you start out. So the, the idea is think about loading this piece of the vector into cache, of the, the values into cache, um, and then, um, then computing those steps. And you can get um, in, uh, what do we have there, three steps. Um, you can get this set of points there that shrinks by one in every step. Um, so now we can we can have an algorithm that does the whole thing. We can do the first step here, which is the left piece. Then the the right the the next piece actually can be kind of a, it's no longer a trapezoid, but we can use these um, parallelograms and um, compute like this at the, um, by and, and still have all the dependencies being recognized. So this would be a serial algorithm. If we have a parallel algorithm, we'd have these trapezoids growing up, and we'd have to figure out how to fill in the pieces. So this is called the matrix powers kernel. And the idea is by reading the matrix only once, and you're going to read chunks of it at each time, at each time step, but, uh, or each piece here, um, we're going to, to be able to take, say, three steps um, in the solver um, with one read of the matrix. So the, these are called k-step methods. These ideas have come up in other contexts and for other terms of numerical reasons that you want want these kinds of algorithms, but in this case, we're just looking at it from the communication optimization standpoint. Um, skip over some of the details in the parallel case now just to show uh, Oops, what happens, except if my laptop dies. Um, so in the, um, in the parallel algorithm, as I said, you have, you have these trapezoids. Oof, that's not looking very good. Um, 
Let's see if I saved my file before I... So you have these trapezoids, but they're overlapping, which is why you get those little triangles. Okay. Yeah, Microsoft is not, not, not serving me well here. Let me skip the uh, animation there and say what this, so I, sh I was showing you a picture of what this looks like for a tridiagonal matrix. If you have a more general sparse matrix, it's a much more complicated piece of software to write um, to get a matrix powers kernel. So what we want to do is compute A times X, A squared times X, A cubed times X, and so on with just one read of the matrix, and we'll do it by reading a piece of the matrix at each time. So a general sparse matrix is a general um, arbitrary unstructured mesh, the edges of course being the, the non-zeros in the matrix. So think of this as picking up a piece of the matrix and then um, doing multiple steps, and what's going to happen is we will we will shrink the number of things that we can um, that we can evaluate that we can compute um, in each iteration. Or the other way to think about it is I need to get a larger and larger set of ghost values outside of this thing. If I want to compute the yellow region, then I need to have the red values to get a squared t a, a times x, and the green ones to get a squared times x and the blue ones get a cubed times x. So I'll read in a bigger chunk. Now this is, there's ongoing work here, um, and there's uh, a question about what it means for these matrices to be partitionable well enough that you can actually um, do this. If you've got a really random looking matrix, then uh, this idea doesn't work very well because the, the boundary values, the neighboring values, gets to be a very large set. But um, in this case, um, and it, it uh, um, for a, something that can be well partitioned, it actually, um, it can be used. And as I said, there's a bunch of ongoing work both on the numerics of this and how to uh, partition these matrices. I'll just point it even that I might have have um, made out because you, if in a cache memory system where the, you're trying to make sure only the values that you need are loaded into memory, you need to be very careful about where you lay out each of these edges in memory so that you get contiguous these little edges edges here all are contiguous in memory, and of course this is going to be, these edges over here are going to be part of another piece um, for a different partition of the matrix. So uh, there's a little traveling salesman problem that gets solved in order to do that, that uh, matrix layout. Um, here's some speed ups showing that um, for the, the A to the K kernel, the matrix powers kernel, is actually runs at a higher uh, performance rate than the um, AX kernel. Now that's a good thing. Um, so, so the red lines are the original and these are a bunch of different matrices and the green ones are the matrix powers kernel. Uh, it doesn't do you any good though to run at a higher gigaflop rate if it doesn't work when you put this back into the algorithm. So what happens when you put something like this into GM res? Um, well, there's, there's something that I'm going to completely brush over, which is um, that you have to, there's, there's parts outside of the um, matrix vector multiply. So here's the sparse matrix vector multiply, and this instead becomes a matrix powers operation in the communication avoiding algorithm. There's the modified Gram-Schmidt part over here, which becomes, uh, is a uh, tall skinny, it was called tall skinny QR. So that's, it, you can think of that as the reduction part of the algorithm. So obviously there's lots of details here that I'm not talking about. Um, but you can actually prove that you're using, doing less communication traffic in this communication avoiding algorithm than you are in the original algorithm. Um, there's a problem though, which is we're not exactly running the same algorithm anymore because we've, in some sense, I, from a, as a compiler writer, I think of this as um, there's a loop in here for sparse matrix vector multiply, um, and there's a loop in here for these reductions and so on, um, and then this outer loop. And what we've done is we've kind of rearranged things so that the outer loop is, is jumping by K, and, um, and instead we're going to take one of these bigger steps. And so um, we've changed the numerics. So this is what happens in terms of the numerical stability. This is the original GM res algorithm. So it all looks good. Um, it's converging over time, uh, those iteration count on the x-axis. Um, this is what happens if you put the communication avoiding GM res um, into the code. So you can put the matrix powers kernel into the solver um, and it no longer works at a, as a viable solver. However, if you, um, use a different, what's called a different basis, so in this particular case a Newton basis, and, and by the way there's, this is one of the areas of research is looking at exactly what are the best bases to use in this case, um, you can get the convergence back. And that Newton basis is still gives you something like that matrix powers kernel that gets used in the inner loop. And if you put the whole thing together, this is results from, these are results from Mark Homan's thesis, I somehow don't 
I lost his name on this version of the slide, but um, this shows that you can actually um, get, so it combines the matrix powers kernel, which was uh, Margu Mahoyden's uh, research, and then uh, Mark's work on the solver, um, and you can actually get a better, um, better performance. These, this, is, um, this is the uh, relative runtime, and uh, so down is good. So this is the optimized version, and this is the original version. And there's some breakdowns in terms of where, this, where the time goes. I think in this particular case, actually, the... Um, uh, some of the, the biggest speed up was actually from the modified Gram Schmidt into the TSQR, this, this, um, this uh, orange piece right here. And the uh, matrix powers kernel is the blue to the red part. And there's some other, uh, other um, operations that are in there as well. Okay, so um, as I said, this is ongoing work, um, but the, the main point that I want you to think about is that we're, we have, we're rethinking the algorithms from a standpoint of how to make them communication optimal or how to avoid communication. Avoiding communication has always been a good thing to do when you're thinking about programming MPI. Messages are expensive, um, but this is thinking about it not not just in the message passing uh, uh, kind of world, but also when you're looking at um, number of loads and stores to memory. And we're, you also may be familiar with that with things like um, tiling matrix multiply, but this is now kind of raising the level of abstraction in which we're doing those communication optimizations. We're not just trying to make the kernels go faster, we're rethinking what kernels we can use so that we can get um, more potential for um, optimizations. Lots of ongoing work here in whether these algorithms are going to be viable in practice, um, preconditioning, and, um, and so on. There's some references to the people working on that. The second kind of class of communication avoiding algorithms I want to talk about are um, these uh, come from dense linear algebra. Um, and the example here is actually just matrix multiply. So this is dense matrix multiply. And I'm just showing you here both, uh, there's, there's some formulas that I won't read about. Uh, provable uh, performance improvement in terms of the provable reduction communication that you get from what's called a 2.5D algorithm. And I'll give you a little hint about what the 2.5D algorithm looks like on the, on the next slide. But uh, I think the thing that surprised me about this work, and I wasn't involved in this, this was um, work between Edgar Solomonic, who's a graduate student here, and Jim Demmel, was um, that anybody could make matrix multiply go any faster, um, and that it was actually a, a somewhat different algorithm. Um, you will see this algorithm come up in various parts of the literature, but it was, um, it was not really the algorithm that people had been using. Um, and this 2.5D version is slightly different than, um, than what other people had been using. So the first thing that surprised me was that um, you know, even matrix multiply had room for improvement. Um, and then, then the question was, why did, what, what was the trick that was in this optimization? And, and to me, the, the, uh, the trick was that the C matrix, the result matrix, um, that you make multiple copies of it. Um, and, uh, and you make some copies of this and then redundantly, uh, the, and, and then compute different subsets, if you will, of the answer. Each one of the copies has a different piece of the answer, and then you combine them together at the end. Um, so you can prove also that these, this is optimal in terms of its communication pattern. Um, and the lesson learned from this, um, so we are going to make up extra copies of the data, so you need to have extra memory around. But I think the lesson learned was never waste any fast memory that you have in the system. So it, what that means is if you're running a parallel matrix multiply across a large system um, and you haven't filled up your entire memory with just the uh, single copy of the A, B, and C matrices, um, then you want to may want to make copies of the C matrix um, and run the this kind of communication avoiding algorithm to give you better performance. So the performance gains that you'll see are as the matrix size gets smaller uh, or the machine gets larger, so there's extra memory that you can use in this case. Um, now, but you know, my question, uh, my interest in it was not so much in the matrix multiply uh, problem itself, other than you know understanding this algorithmic idea. The question I had was, can we generalize this for compiler writers? Or can we generalize? it to other algorithms. So let's see exactly how the 2.5D algorithm works, first of all. Um, so we'll just do a cartoon version of matrix multiply. And um, it has a 3D iteration space. So this is what a compiler writer would think about. Uh, for i, for j, for k, there's some stuff in the middle. We're going to have to look at what that stuff is. But that gives us a three-dimensional iteration space that we're running around in. Every point in that iteration space is going to be a multiply and an add that come up from the matrix multiply computation. So what's the inner loop look like? Well, there's a C matrix. Um, and the C matrix is, being, um, is, is uh, over i and j. So it's kind of, you can think about it as being on this face, the ij face of the cube. 
The um, A matrix is over I and K, so that's on the IK face, which is the, the front one of the cube. Um, or I guess maybe the back one, depending on how you're, uh, you view it. And, the, um, and then the JK, the B matrix is the JK loop, and this, at least the way we've written the algorithm, and so that's the side. Um, all right, so there's uh, an, an, an each, in, each interior point, the unit cube, if you will, or the points inside of this are a constant amount of computation, and that's very important to the model, that um, there's, a, there's a single multiply and a single add at every point in there, or every t little tiny cube. And what we're doing in tiling the iteration space is we're going to c compute some subcube of these nested loops. So normally in loop tiling, what we do is we take a three nested loops like this, and we might turn it into six nested loops. And what each one of those inner loops is doing is computing one of the cubes within the iteration space, and then you combine them together. But normally, um, and the, the, the way you think about this in, in, um, in, kind of in compilers and actually the way most of the parallel algorithms for matrix multiply, most parallel implementations of matrix, mul matrix multiply look, is you divide up the A, the B, and the C matrix across the processors and then you figure out which things they can compute given the data that they have from A, B, and C. Um, and then you communicate what you, um, what you don't already, um, what you don't have in order to complete the, the computation of the problem. So the, the most natural thing to do is divide up the C matrix, right, the top of it, and have every one, every processor compute one of these columns and they will have to, to communicate the A and the B data in order to see all the pieces of that. So this is kind of what one of those, uh, uh, some subcube within there looks like. Um, I need to get the projection of that cube on each of the three faces in order to compute the values that are in the interior. Um, and the, uh, um, you know, and the advantages that I, so, so, so what's different though about this, uh, this communication avoiding algorithm is that I'm not just going to um, partition this, partition up the C matrix and leave it where it is using what we would call in the compiler literature an owner computes rule. I'm actually going to take copies of the C matrix and spread them out over the processors and so I'm going to divide in this dimension. Um, and so in the, uh, the K loop is, the, the uh, K dimension loop is, has dependencies in it. So some compilers would look at that and say you can't, you can't parallelize in that, that dimension. They happen to be very simple dependencies in which there's a associative and commutative operator, nam namely plus, um, being used across this, this um, dimension. And so I could actually uh, parallelize over that as well. Uh, modulo the fact that I'm going to get a different answer because I'll do the additions in a different order. So. Um, now it turns out, and I, and I won't spend a long time talking about this because there's some uh, fairly hard mathematics underneath this due to an algorithm um, by Loomis and Whitney, that if you ask the question of whether what's the best way to divide up this cube in order to minimize the total amount of communication, the communication being the, the projection on the faces, so the amount of memory that you need, um, the question is sort of what's the blob that you could put in the middle in which you can get the most work done with the minimum amount of um, area on the faces. And that's a, a equivalent to a geometric problem, which is um, given an arbitrary blob in the middle of this, um, what is the smallest projection that you can get out? And the best case is for, um, indeed, a, a cube. So, um, so that says the right way to tile this up is, um, is with a cube. Now, I, I was trying to understand then from this, when I, once I understood the algorithm in terms of what they were doing, whether you could apply this to other, other um, algorithms. And so I was thinking about a, a really simple problem, which is a naive um, n-body calculation where you're doing an order n squared algorithm. So in a naive n-body code, you just have n particles, and you want to co compute forces between all pairs of particles. Um, and there's variations of this, by the way, in which you, you've got a cutoff distance and so on. But we'll look at just the simple case here. So the normal way in which you would parallelize something like this, if we give it to you in kind of a, an introductory assignment, is you, you're given n particles, you'll divide them up over p processors, and then you'll kind of rotate copies of those p particles, or those n particles around, so that eventually every processor sees every particle, and you can compute the, you know, the order n squared over p is the amount of computation you're doing, and you've got p messages because everybody has to send um, every every. Um, their particles around um, uh, once for every other processor, and the bandwidth is order n words. So basically, everything gets communicated. So can we do better than this with the communication avoiding idea? Well, in this case, we've got a 1D algorithm that we're going to think of as a 2D decomposition. So we'll call it a 1.5D decomposition. Um, the other one, we were thinking of a 3D, a kind of in between a, a full 2D and a 3D decomposition. 
And um, so what we're doing in this case is we'll take, we'll divide our P processors into C groups of processors. Each one of those sets of processors will own one copy of the, the particles. So we replicate the particles uh, across each group. So we've divided them. So, you know, this is the original set of particles that's divided over a smaller set of processors and then replicated over the C dimension. And then we, um, so that we copy them. And then we kind of have to make sure that they can all see different, different parts of the space. So they'll each be responsible for the original set of particles that they own, um, but then we'll, we'll send the copies to different parts of the um, different, uh, different neighboring processors in this grid. Um, and then you're going to compute the particles and the, the pairs that you have between the two sets of things. Um, and eventually, uh, you'll, you'll um, pass the particles around so that everybody sees everything. So what does this mean is by the end of this, um, each, each one of these rows will have a subset of the answer. You need to still add them all together in order to get the final answer. So you do a reduction. Um, so this is also work in progress. And there's, uh, so here's a little performance model that shows a 10x, uh, 11x speed up for a certain size problem. And um, we're looking at a bunch of other, um, uh, other algorithms and also looking at um, how this actually works in practice. And there are some implementation uh, projects underway. So roughly, this is the same idea as kind of parallel force dimension. Actually, I'm not sure that's quite true. Um, it's used in a code called NAMD for molecular dynamics. Um, but that, that idea that you don't just decompose the particles, you also decompose the computations that are done in those particles, it has been used in the past to give you more parallelism. It's also being used in this case to give you less communication volume. Um, it's also used in some, some of the optimizations we've done in these particle and cell methods, like in the GTC code that I mentioned earlier. What you do is you replicate the copies of the, um, of the uh, grid that you're updating so that you can independently update those copies and not have as many locks in the code. So it's, uh, this technique is also used for synchronization avoidance. Okay, so um, you know, communication avoidance is, a, is an old idea. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a seminal paper by Hung and Kung that talks about communication optimality. Um, what is kind of a new way, at least in my mind, of thinking about this is that the level of abstraction at which we're trying to um, optimize communication is not just within a kernel, but up through a, a solver. So it's starting with, say, BLAS2, which are matrix vector multiply type operations, to BLAS3, which is matrix matrix operations, all the way up to LU decomposition, or from the sparse matrix vector multiply and the dot product, optimizing those kernels up to optimizing the Krilov subspace method. And by raising the level of abstraction at which you're optimizing, you can get, you have more opportunities to avoid communication to get better reuse of the uh, fast memory on your system. Um, you know, it changes the numerics in some cases in non-trivial ways, so it's not something that a compiler can necessarily um, do in, in many cases, although we, we are looking at ways in which we can automate um, some of those. And um, it can you know, be beneficial for both avoiding communication and avoiding synchronization. Uh, not very good for software engineering, by the way, because you're kind of breaking down the abstraction barriers. And so your code can get pretty complicated because the units at which you're optimizing is now a bigger piece. OK, so a little bit about programming models. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about here is a programming model that should feel to you like MPI. So how many people, so, so let's see, you've all programmed now a little bit in MPI, is that right? OK, so you should be familiar with the single program multiple data model of computing in MPI. And what that means is that the main function, think about it this way, is the main function is just replicated over all the processors that you say to run it on. So you write one main function, it calls different functions. but um, So there's a single program, but there's you have different data on different processors. So it's a, a very popular model in MPI. There are variations, just to be fair to MPI, and which are not purely SPMD, um, but that's, um, that's the basic model. But we're also using it for uh, problems that are more irregular, um, but with a different kind of, not, not in a message passing framework. So these languages, which is what I've been doing research on for a number of years, are called partition global address space languages. Has anybody programmed in UPC or CoArray Fortran? OK, one person back there. <laughs> yeah. uh, right. So, uh, um, so, so this is just a, a different kind of uh, model that's somewhat related to message passing and somewhat related to OpenMP, because you're, you're learning OpenMP in here, right, also? Uh, not, not really. No. You're doing, you're doing libraries, right? OK. Um, OK, so how many have programmed in OpenMP? 
OK, so this would be in between MPI and OpenMP. What is the idea? Well, it has the control model that you're most familiar with from MPI. That is, take the main function and replicate it over all the processors. You start with a fixed number of threads when you run the program, and that number of threads runs all the way to the end of the program. And in between there, you can do barrier synchronizations and get them together. But in between the barriers, they can be going off and doing different things. Um, you can have reduction operations and broadcast operations and so on called collectives. Um, so the same idea comes up in these partition global address space languages. So we've got a fixed number of processors that we think about in our machine model. Um, but instead of having message passing, what we've got is the address space is shared or is global so that I can have data structures in which I link together things that are all, uh, there's a single shared data structure. So I can have a shared array that's shared by across all the processors. I can have, uh, a, in this case, it's a picture of a shared linked list that all the processors can see. Um, and I can have other, um, other comp more complicated data structures like trees and graphs, sparse matrices, and so on. Um, now, the, so that's what the global address space gives you, is the ability to have these shared data structures. And it is really the model that you have in OpenMP, which is shared shared memory, um, and you can read, all the processors can read and write that shared memory. So what makes this a little different is that that memory is logically partitioned. So there's a piece of the memory that I can think of as nearby my processor, and other parts of the memory I can read and write to them, as I can in OpenMP, but I know that they're further away. So the way it's kind of captured in this picture is I've got two pointers here. I've got a pointer L and a pointer G. G is a global pointer, and G can point any this space whereas L can only point within my local partition of the um, local address space. So these are used, um, and I seem to have taken one of my slides, it's probably going to show up later, out. Um, they're especially used for problems in which you want to do random accesses to memory. So I sometimes call this the never say receive model, because um, in, in MPI, of course, you eventually have to have a matching receive operation to go with any send operation. In a PGAS model, you can do a put, that is a write, or a get, which is a read, and the other program on the other side never has to tell, has to acknowledge that the the read or the write is happening. So it make it's very useful if you're trying to build something like a um, a histogram where the other processors don't know that you're trying to update their buckets in the histogram. Um, now, there's a lot of debate right now in the research community on whether we like this SPIMD model. Um, and uh, I'll say a, a little bit about that. We want something a little bit more hierarchical. Um, I think, uh, let me just say that you can, get, you can get very good performance out of these. Um, this is some old performance data, but you're using the network very effectively because you're doing this one-sided communication that tends to map well onto the, the network hardware. Um, this is, these are some performance results from a 3D FFT. And what you're seeing here in the yellow is the best UPC implementation, so one of these PGAS languages, compared to the best MPI implementation. Slightly different algorithm that turns out to be the best in both cases, but we're always taking the best algorithm um, for that given program model. The reason that you end up with different, different algorithms or different implementations for the different cases is because MPI tends to be better if you put all the mess you send as few messages as possible and aggregate them, them together, whereas UPC sometimes is better if you send more messages because you get better overlap and the overhead is small enough that you can actually afford to send more messages. Um, now, it turns out that these PGAS languages, and this is actually looking at a language called Titanium that we also did, um, and this is based on Java, so it's a higher level language, um, can give you some noticeable improvement in how easy it is to write the code. Um, here's a, a version of some, a code. This is a Poisson solver written in Titanium, and the same code written in C++ and Fortran and MPI. Um, now, you might say that's unfair because a lot of this code in the MPI case is actually library code that does get reused. But in, so, in some sense, in the Titanium case, that library code gets put into the language runtime um, and gets uh, debugged once, and uh, the, 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 it gets used across the scientific domains. So these, these uh, languages are, are useful for these kind of irregular access patterns, um, and they perform pretty well, sometimes better, actually, than, as you've seen, than the, um, the, uh, the um, uh, MPI algorithms. So a little bit more about the difference between uh, the MPI message passing model and the traditional MPI message passing model and the PGAS message passing model, which we often call one-sided communication. And even if you have no interest in using the PGAS languages like UPC or Coray Fortran, um, and we're thinking about a new dialect, by the way, based on Python, that um, 
Uh, this one-sided communication model is being investigated in MPI-3. It was in MPI-2, but not done well enough. I think that people were actually using it, but it's being redone in MPI-3. So the, the one-sided model will, will come back in that, that case, in, even in MPI. Um, so what's the difference between a one-sided and two-sided message? Some people have said, well, it makes no sense to talk about a one-sided message because, of course, a message has to involve two, two processors in the machine, so they're all two-sided. Well, the difference is that a two-sided message, like an MPI, traditional MPI send and receive message, has a message ID and some data that you're sending. You send it across the network. It gets picked up by the network interface, um, and the network interface may have the ability to, to do a DMA operation that is right directly into memory, but it doesn't know where to put the data because the information about where that goes is actually sitting in the receive operation that's coming from the program that's written over here on this side, right? Because this receive operation says, here's the receive operation and here's the data structure in which to put the data, um, and so you don't know where to put it. Um, and whereas in a one-sided message, you actually put an address inside of the message, so when it comes over here, a network interface can directly write it into memory. And for that reason, you can avoid some of the synchronization overhead of the message passing uh, computation itself, um, and it can save you, um, it can give you faster performance. So we know that synchronization is a problem that's limiting performance, and uh, avoiding synchronization is going to be an important thing at all levels, of, uh, including at the algorithmic level, which is the picture on the right, where we've got some complicated DAG. What we, what we could do is draw a barrier synchronization point at all those different points in the DAG, but what we really want to do is avoid barriers as much as possible. You know, we're not quite sure exactly um, how, much, how much irregularity we're going to have in the system, that is how how, how much different the speeds are going to be of the different processors and to what extent we really have to avoid all global synchronization and then also how much, uh, you know, will these one-sided ideas at, give us on these, um, on these new network interfaces that will be coming up. So, um, so the SPMD execution model then also has a problem and that is very flat um, and what we know is that, um, as I said before, the machines are going to have um, variable performance. What we're looking at now is a more hierarchical um, SPMD model in which we have groups of threads that are put together in a hierarchy, and you can have all of them work on a single part of the computation while, they, while others are doing something different. So this comes up um, either because something like a climate modeling code, multi-physics code of any kind, where you say some sub subset of processors are working on the atmosphere and another set of processors are working on the ocean, others could be working on ice, whatever. Um, so you can divide things up that way based on tasks, and it also comes up because um, of your physical machine structure. That is, you may have a bunch of processors that are all, can all communicate by shared memory, and you want to run one algorithm within shared memory and a different algorithm then across the shared memory. Um, so we're looking at these kind of hierarchical um, partition global address space models that can be um, where we have these memory spaces and now pointers that I had before is just either pointing within my space or, or to a neighboring space can have different uh, types in which they can point uh, nearby or a little further away or even further away. And so this will reflect, the pointers then will reflect the communication costs um, that are on the system. Um, now, the, the other complication that comes up when you've got something hierarchical like this is you still would like to be able to do collective operations. I'd still like to be able to do a barrier if I need to or do a reduction or a broadcast operation. And so um, the next thing that uh, we're doing is being able to put, take this kind of, these kind of um, operations that are th this sort of single program multiple data model and make it more recursive, um, hierarchical, hierarchically recursive. And so you can do this by having subsets of threads um, that can have barriers. Now this idea is already in MPI with their MPI communicators. What is um, happening in these, these language-based implementations is trying to still prove that, um, for example, all of the processors are going to hit the same barrier at the same time so you, can, you don't um, end up with, uh, with a deadlock. And this last graph is just showing that having this kind of hierarchical model is much better than having a flat model from the kinds of machines that we have today. This is looking at a distributed sort algorithm on Hopper, uh, actually on Franklin, which is the previous Cray system at, uh, at NERSC. And um, it's looking at the, the, um, the, the, the um, running time of the uh, pure distributed case versus having some mixed parallelism with different algorithms. So you actually are running two different kinds of sorting algorithms within a shared memory node and between the shared memory node. And the uh, performance you get, at least when you get up to scale, is, uh, is better for the, the mixed case than it is for the single case. 
So to conclude, uh, there's a lot of things that you have to worry about when, as we worry about the next generation of machines. So you're certainly worrying about the scale of the machine, synchronization avoidance, um, energy management, which may just cause performance perturbations in your system or maybe something that's more explicitly controlled, um, some kind of dynamic system behavior, either because of energy management or because of just performance variability uh, from the, the network congestion or from the, um, from, from the memory system structure irregular algorithms that you need to map onto this um, complicated hierarchical machine, so how you get some more hierarchical control over the system, and resilience, which would be failures. But all of these kind of are, are things that you trade off against um, a problem that we know is a problem. So some of these things, we're not quite sure how big these problems are going to be. The thing that we know is a problem is communication, which means, uh, for, like your, your real estate agent will tell you, it's all about location, location, location. So uh, that's just sort of the, the way to think about the problems as you go forward is you should be really worrying about optimizing for communication and locality um, and, uh, and probably some of these other things as well, but definitely this one. And unfortunately, they do trade off against each other because some of the things that you want to do, for example, to support irregular algorithms say, well, just throw everything up uh, you know, randomly on the machine and let them fall wherever they may. I, I will get a, a good load balance from that from an irregular problem, but it does, does terrible things to locality. With that, I will stop and see if there are any questions. Any questions? I, I couldn't see uh, totally clearly from the example, but do you have the analog of a split phase collective? Um, um, that's important for Krilov. For Krilov subspace methods, yeah. Um, you mean in UPC, in, the, in that yeah, kind of model? And, and, well, it was that UPC in the Java, is that? Uh, that was a tit titanium, titanium. I mean, yeah, 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 right, titanium. Uh, so we don't have, we definitely do not have them in titanium. We have, um, we have non-blocking collectives. Yeah, there's a, there's a proposal for some of the explicit non-blocking stuff that's going into UBC, but it has, it, there are, um, as I'm sure you can appreciate, semantic issues that cause a lot of debate progress. about, yeah, progress and, um, but other things about when do you know when the there's when the collective is completely. I see. Okay, so we can try to do it right this time, but I think it's it's not completely settled in terms of what those will look like either in UPC. But um, the, what UPC has had from the very beginning are what are called split phase barriers. Um, so a split phase barrier is one in which you can say, I am ready to enter the barrier, but I'm going to go off and do something else unrelated until everybody else says that they're at the barrier. And then you can have a separate point where you say, okay, now I really need to make sure everybody else has hit the barrier. And so it allows you to get more overlap. You're not all sitting at that synchronization point. I mean, it requires that you have some independent work you can do that doesn't depend on everybody else getting to the barrier, which is not always the case. But in something like even a, 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 you know, a nearest neighbor stencil computation, what you might do is say, uh, you know, update things that are near your, your exterior region and kind of communicate them out and then do a, I'm at the barrier, which means my data is all updated. Anything that anybody else is going to read has been updated. And now go off and do my local work while I'm waiting for other people to get to the barrier. So that would be the kind of um, algorithm that you would use in that split phase barrier setting. And this would be, yeah, for the collectives then, it's uh, just to reduce that you want to be able to overlap the collectives with the, with the computation also and with each other. Yes. You mentioned that uh, uh, that one of the problems with exascale computing is that there's going to be a, uh, a higher rate of, of like uh, errors, of random errors. Uh, in current computers, what what sort of rate is that, and is it something we have to worry about in in reading our results? Um, you know, it is something that we see today. In, um, in our computers. So there's different kinds of errors, okay? So the first thing that we worry about um, is errors that take the whole system down. Okay, so those are completely obvious. You'll know when they happen. Um, and this was actually a problem for us in our previous system, which had uh, didn't have a reliable network. So that what that meant is if somebody walked over and pulled a cable out of the network, the whole system would crash. Okay, and of course you don't usually pull out the cables, but there are other reasons that the, some some bad thing can happen in the network. Um, the current system has a, a fault resilient network. Um, it dynamically routes around uh, failures within the network. So a job will fail if you know if 
you pull out one of the network cables, but the other jobs will keep running. So that's a much better model for an exascale machine, which is going to be a very large system. Um, and certainly, that to me, that is the first requirement on the vendors of an exascale machine, is they have to make sure that failures, um, there are very few failures that can take down the whole system. And I'll tell you what the weak link is now, that it's not the network, it's the file system. And there are still times when the file system, which is this big parallel piece of software, can get screwed up and cause the whole system to crash. But we, we don't see that very often, but I'm just saying that seems to be kind of the thing after the, uh, um, after the uh, um, network that is the, the problem that can cause a whole system outage. Now if we, if we say, okay, we're not worried about those because we expect the vendors to at least protect us from bringing the whole system down just because there's a component failure, um, now we're worried about job failures. And um, it is something that people worry about. And they, uh, the current technique for that is checkpoint restart, which is something that people who are running long-running long simulations do checkpoint their code. So they will write the state out to disk so that if the machine crashes, they can restart from that point in the middle. And it is, um, I, I looked at this uh, a, a, about a month ago, I think at NERSC about, I think it's about 70% of the people have checkpoint restart in their, in their codes. I, I can't remember now. Do you, do you know Harvey? I, I did look at this number. And so it's self-reported, but that's, you know, people say at least they have the functionality in their codes, whether they're using it all the time. Um, I don't know. And now the kind of really nasty problem that we're worrying about is um, unreported errors. So uh, that is something that most you know, people who have looked at it carefully will say you, you do get um, un, unreported errors in your computations today. For the most part, um, we don't worry about them. But um, they can cause the system, they can cause your node to crash depending on where those errors are. I mean, if there's a, I mean, you know, so for example, if there is a bit error in the file system data structures, that can cause the whole file system to fall apart and crash. Um, and there can be things in your, in your code that would cause it to crash. But uh, for the most part, so far, we're not worried about those kind of uh, transient errors, errors that go unreported. Um, there are uh, reported error, you know, uh, memory errors and things like that that you, you will see, but that'll cause, your, that'll cause the node to crash and your, your algorithm to, to crash. So at the moment, for the most part, people are using a pretty brute force technique for this, which is checkpoint the state, you know, save the state, and then if the whole job dies, recover from that. Uh, what we are worrying about, and a lot of people are looking at this in terms of how it would affect the algorithms, is can I have some redundancy in my algorithm that detects that a bit got flipped. Um, can I detect that um, some other kind of error happened in the middle of it and, um, e and recover more gracefully rather than, uh, so if I, if I lose one node, for example, in the middle of my application, can I go grab another node, add it to my computation and recover, perhaps because I've checkpointed just the state of that node out to other nodes in the system and then recovered from it there. So these are some of the kinds of ideas that people are thinking about, but uh, it's a, the, the problem is we don't really know exactly how hard, how, how bad the errors will be and what kind will occur. So it's a little hard to uh, mobilize the entire community to fix a problem they're not quite sure exists or how, how big the problem will be. But yes, you do have to worry about, uh, if you're going to run a simulation for multiple hours, you should be checkpointing it. And you know, sort of a related question was when you mentioned in the roof line, you know, how hard is or how long it takes just to read the metrics in. The same for checkpointing. If we don't have these mechanisms, you know, you're you are dumping, you know, in your simulation probably three terabytes, you know, every ten seconds. So, you know, so it's, <laughs> yeah, don't do it every ten seconds. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah so the people yes. that do this a lot, like the climate modeling climate community, modeling, right. they, which you're familiar with, and when they run these, I mean, they they worry about what's the average time between failures. How much, you know, how do I make sure I'm making forward progress? Because if I'm checkpointing so often, uh, if, you, if you don't checkpoint often enough and the machine fails too often, then you'll never make forward progress because you're always rolling back to the previous state that you started at. Um, if you checkpoint too often, then you're not making forward progress because you're always writing checkpoints. So, you know, you have to, you, you have to hope that there's a, a happy balance in between those two. Okay, so with that, uh, we thank Kathy Thanks. for Thanks. talk.